Fish Stripes and Filtered, episode 25. This is the Jordan Groshans interview, but let's but before that, we got a little bit to talk about some house cleaning to do, as always, with my good friend and host, co-host Isaac Azut. Isaac, what's up? Yeah, you know, we're uh, I'm looking forward to this to this interview. We got a really special player, up the middle player, who who has been really good since coming over to Miami. So I'm looking forward to this one for sure. And then we have managing editor editor of Fish Stripes, Eli Sussman, back on with us again to talk a little bit about Sandy and just a little bit about how good Jordan Groshans has been since joining the AAA Jacksonville. So, Eli, what's up? And, and we're excited to have you on as always. Yeah, Sandy has been impressing us all year. And Jordan, in, in the first couple of weeks in the organization, he has surprised me as well. He's exceeded my expectations so far in these first couple of weeks playing at the highest level of the Marlins minor league system. So before we even talk about Jordan Groshans, I want to get into just what Sandy did last night against a really good San Diego team that is featured by Juan Soto, Manny Machado, Josh Bell, and all these absolute studs on that team. I mean, who else can we even mention? I'm going to read out Sandy's line, and then we'll just get in right into it. I know Isaac was there at the game yesterday, so we'll talk. I'll, I'll go to Isaac first. But seven innings pitched, four hits, zero runs, none earned, two walks, seven strikeouts, and a 1.92 ERA. So he's back down to 200. Isaac, your thoughts on Sandy's performance last night against the Padres? It was a really interesting one. So, you know, he gets off to a great start in the first two innings. He allows a real measly hit to Manny Machado, which, you know, makes his pitch count go up a little bit. But of the first six outs he recorded, five of them were via the strikeout. Um, and then he had a battle from innings like three to five. He had to throw a little bit. He had to throw a lot of pitches, but he was getting the outs. No one ever reached third base for the Padres all game long, which was impressive. And he was just able to keep the Padres off balance. He got Josh Bell swinging twice on the beautiful changeup. And it really just was an impressive start. And then, you know, you're thinking he's already at, you know, 80, close to 80 pitches in the sixth inning. Okay, that might be it. But no, he's able to really settle down and be efficient for the last one. And, you know, let, which let him go through the seventh, struck out seven guys. And he looked as dominant as ever. And I think, you know, it, we, it's time to stop talking about Cy Young. It's, it's a foregone conclusion almost at this point. I think I saw that Fangraphs had him at a minus 260 favorite to win the Cy Young, you know, which is pretty steep. So, you know, I think it might be just time to talk about MVP for this player. Yeah, yeah. Sandy's definitely the Cy Young. I mean, I, I know Eli did a podcast on this on the official show on Monday just talking about that there really isn't another competition for Sandy to win the Cy Young. I mean, he's just on another level. He's going deep into games. He's doing it all. Uh, this guy's carrying the Marlins right now. When he, Every fifth day, he is the man on the mound carrying this team to a win. And luckily, he did get some nice run support, although they didn't score more than three runs. He still got a J.J. Bleday homer, and he got a Miguel Rojas. He, he Jacob Stallings, I'm sorry, RBI single that drove in Miggy Rowe. But, Eli, just your thoughts on the Sandy start and, and why he is the NL Cy Young for sure. There's no one else that's going to win that award over him at the moment. Right. I mean, there's, he's just fantastic. He's been so good almost the entire season. The big difference between last year and this year is that there were a couple starts last year where he really got his ass kicked uh, against the Dodgers and against the Rockies. I still very vividly remember those. And there's been nothing like that this year. You know, even when he's bad, he still gets you into the middle innings. And the fact that he just always keeps the ball in the ballpark, that he's always challenging these hitters, I would say that. In his this last start, he got probably better than average help from his defense. The defense is really good yeah. behind him, and he's somebody that he really embraces the fact that he thinks he can get the right kind of soft contact that his teammates will be able to convert. He's not hunting for strikeouts. He values working deep into games more so than getting Ks. That's kind of unconventional. It's like Really, the only case that people can make against Sandy is if you look at what you call ERA estimators. You look at fielder independent pitching. You look at expected earned run average. There are other pitchers that are right in the same neighborhood as him, if not even a little bit ahead of him. The reality is that what makes him so special is that it works better for him than any of these estimators can like put a number on. Like he is, he has these intangibles that what he's doing, the formula that now a lot of it is Sandy himself, but some credit needs to go to Jacob Stallings as well in having him pushing the right buttons placing these pitches, throwing these pitches with so much conviction that he's always trusting Stallings in these big situations to get these crucial outs, that he is overachieving what anybody could have, what any of these formulas could have anticipated. 
works even better than you think it should. And when you add it all together, um, the actual results are undeniable. Like the overall value that he's provided this year is so far and beyond everybody else because he works deep into games and because he's just not allowing runs. Uh, if you want to put one catch-all number on it, you can look at baseball reference, wins above replacement. He has two full wins ahead of everybody else in the National League. Mm-hmm. This is the kind of margin you very rarely see it in the Cy Young race. Like This is not normal for someone to separate themselves as much as they have in the race the way that Sandy has. He could have a very long career, and um, but I don't think there, there might not be another season like this where he's so head and shoulders ahead of everybody else. So I encourage everybody to savor it as much as they can. And just to be clear, yeah. a URA plus of 211, yeah. which is just unheard of, for over, especially over 173 innings pitch. And we're not even in September yet. 173 innings. It's We really shouldn't take this for granted. It's spectacular. Yeah, definitely. And I'm glad Eli mentioned Jacob Songs because the guy not only on defense has been really good lately, he – him on offense has been just on fire. The guy's hitting 364, 435, 509, 944 when it comes to offense. And then defense, this guy has been just took Sandy to the next level. As Eli mentioned, Pablo's been very good this year. Trevor has had his up and down starts. So, Isaac, just your thoughts on post All Star Jacob Stallings? Because I know we've done a lot of criticism on pre All Star Jacob Stallings already. Yeah, you know, Jacob, he had this really hot streak. When Miami was in Arizona and, you know, you had this nice little hot streak in May and it didn't last too long. It lasted a couple of weeks. And I see, I see some of the same stuff right now from him, but it's been a little bit prolonged and it's, you know, he's looked good. He looks comfortable at the plate. He's not swinging and missing. He's not selling out, you know, on off speed and he looks really good. He looks really comfortable at the plate. We asked Donnie yesterday if he just notices any mechanical changes, any changes in stance. And he said, no, he's, if anything, it's been very minor. So I think it's just a sense of getting hot and getting not hot. And I think right now he's just on one of those hot streaks. And I think that translates into the defense as well. Just like a player like Miguel Rojas, he's hitting the ball really well right now. And at short, you can tell he's really comfortable. So, you know, both of those players on the offensive side who we've, you know, heavily criticized all year long, you know, they're, they're picking it up right now in August. Yep. So I think now it's the time where we could, Transitioned a little bit to Jordan Groshans. He was acquired by the Marlins in exchange for Anthony Bass, Zach Pop, and a player to be named later, as we all remember that. The one and only move the Marlins made. So I, I guess we could talk a little bit about the move. Very Let's keep it very, very simple. I, Eli, what were your thoughts on that trade? Were you a fan of it? Did you hate it? Did you love it? Just, And then we'll get into the player itself, how good he's been in AAA for Jacksonville this season, and how interesting he is because this is a guy who gets on base a lot, and, and he walks a lot enough, and everything. It was, I was frustrated as I voiced several times about the fact that they didn't make more deals that would have made sense for either the near term or the long term of the team. But this trade was, any way you looked at it, I thought was a solid trade. Like they moved relievers. I would assume the player to be named later is either a reliever or a low probability big leaguer. And they got a player in Groshans who was not that long ago a first round draft pick, someone that very recently was almost a consensus top 100 prospect in all of baseball. And they bought a little low on him. The reason he's available happens to be with the Blue Jays team that is really going for it, that had all the offense they already needed, and especially in the infield, he was more expendable to them than he would be to most other organizations. And they are taking the bet that they can unlock more power out of him. And that's something that comes up in the in the interview. Is and it's undeniable that people want to see that translate into more extra base hits and more home runs when he's actually on the field. He is still just 22 years old, and the pedigree that he has is is impressive. For them to get kind of just moving spare parts, essentially, to get somebody like him that could fill a very important need on their team, perhaps next year, especially in 2024, when a lot of their current infielders are going to be free agents or pending free agents, it was it was a good move, no doubt about it. As you mentioned, he's it's off to an encouraging start as well, based on how he's performed since joining the Jumbo Shrimp. Yeah, and I think it's fair to mention that the trade was a good one because they have replacements in the minor leagues, as we've mentioned. One of them recently called up in, in Andrew Nardi, with, along with Parker Bogle. We've pretty much mentioned that Parker Bogle is in the top guy. So Josh Simpson is down there. Yeah, Freeanne, all those type of guys in AA, AAA are down there waiting 
And it didn't look like the worst move at the time, but I'm pretty sure Craig mentioned on his podcast that Anthony Bass would have been back with the $3 million club option if he was not dealt. But Isaac, just your initial thoughts on the trade and just how he's been doing at AAA so far. Yeah, I, I guess you got to just think, would you rather have an elite seventh, eighth inning guy in the major leagues next year or would you rather have Jordan Groshans? So, you know, I, I think they did a fine trade. I know Craig was very happy with it. Some other, some other people were like, you know, meh about it, but there's no denying that Groshans has been really good. He's a, he's got a really solid hit tool, man. And I, I'm really excited to see how that translated at the big league level since joining Miami, AAA Jacksonville. He's hitting 273, getting on base over 100 points higher, 385, slugging about 400. So, you know, if he does that in the major leagues, it's a, it's a hell of a win for, for this organization. But it, it's all about the slugging, you know, and how much power he taps into eventually. Like we mentioned in the interview, the, the exit velocity is up. And he, he's aware of it. He's aware that he hasn't hit for much power this year. So I, I think it all depends on that. And he, he has looked good. He has looked really good def both defensively and offensively since coming over. Yeah, and I think that's the right time to transition to the Jordan Gershon's <laughs> interview. So from Isaac, from Eli, from myself, we'll see you guys in two weeks. Peace out and go fish. Fish Stripes and Filter, episode 25, the Jordan Groshans interview. But before we get to inter introduce Jordan Groshans, Isaac, episode 25, you were just at Sandy's start. He shut out the Padres. How are you and how how's everything going, man? Yeah, it was great to see Sandy get back on track there from an un-Sandy-like start in Philadelphia where he got – beat up late in the game, but, you know, he was back to being Sandy, seven shutout innings against a very formidable San Diego Padres lineup. And next day, we're very excited to speak with Mr. Jordan Groshans. Yeah, so Jordan Groshans was acquired at the trade deadline. Next <coughs> Anthony Bass, Zach Pop, player to be named later. He is the Miami Marlins' number four prospect, according to MLB Pipeline. Jordan, first of all, thank you for uh, joining us. How are you and how is AAA treating you so far in Jacksonville? Thanks for having me, guys. Um, it's good, you know. It's a good group of guys, good coaching staff. Um, I'm glad to be here, getting a lot of work done, and, and figuring some things out. So, I want to ask good. you about the day of the trade deadline. Just the just your initial reaction of being traded and how that process was from going to where you were in AAA Buffalo over here to Jacksonville. Yeah, it was it was a little bit of a shock. I didn't think. I knew there was a possibility. I didn't think I was going to. Um, but, hey, it's a business. You know, it happens. So, got the phone call, got my stuff, and, and now I'm here. So, that's about it. Just kind of. Yeah, so if you don't mind what I got the call. And, mm -hmm. Huh? What's up? No, sorry about it. Go ahead. No, it was just like I got the call, packed my stuff, and headed down here. So, Nice. And, you know, we're going to go back a little bit just to, you know, your draft year in 2018. Uh, it was reported that Miami did have interest in you. Toronto selected you one spot ahead of Miami, 12th overall. Was there any belief in your mind that you thought you could go to Miami back in 2018? I I thought that's who, for the most part, it was them and the Blue Jays. Um, I remember the Blue Jays and the Marlins were, were the two teams that had a lot of people, you know, at the high school games, free draft, stuff like that. So, uh, I actually went to a pre-draft in Miami and met Jeter, worked out, did a whole bunch of cool stuff down there at the stadium. So um, really familiar with, with the park, with the area and everything. So, um, yeah, it's it's nice knowing that not only did I get traded, I got traded to an organization that possibly would have drafted me. Yeah. Um, so it kind of makes that switch a little bit more comfortable knowing that these guys have won it me here and, and now that I'm here it feels kind of like home so it's really nice right I'm sure and then before you got drafted you actually played in the Under Armour All-American game in Wrigley Field so I just wanted to ask you how was that experience you know playing in one of the most historic stadiums in all of sports yeah it was, it was really good you know uh, I was a lot younger at the time so I didn't I didn't really get the pro experience and, and of being there and, and playing on that field. It was more kind of like a high school kid. You know, I get to play out here on the big league field. So it was good. It was a good time. Um, the game was really fun. We, we were lucky we got to play night games. So it really kind of kind of brought in everything all together. Um, it was a good time. So uh, hopefully I'll get to be back and play on that field in the big leagues pretty, pretty soon. So um, 
that's the goal, you know. Jordan, you, you suffered an oblique injury earlier in the season. Would you say there's anything that you learned about yourself during the rehab process or just recovering from that injury? Yeah, you know, it's it's this game is very mental. Um, you know, it's I see a lot of people nowadays, they all they do is on Twitter and on social media. And it's like you gotta stay within yourself in this game and then you know, getting hurt kind of kind of makes you mentally strong, you know, going through rehab isn't it's not an easy process. It's it's very, very mental, not a lot. I mean, the physical part, yeah, you're you rehabbing, but that part's not the hard part. You know, doing rehab exercises, stuff like that. It's not not the problem. It's it's staying mentally strong and knowing that you're gonna come out come out stronger on the other side of it. So um going through that stuff, you know, it sucked having to miss the first month, but but going through it has been been something that's helped me in the long run. Yeah, so many young players these days are swinging for the fences despite the strikeouts that come with that. You have been doing pretty much the opposite this season, just making a lot of contact, but with only one homer. Is that a power hitting potential still in there for you? So, you know, what have you been working to get that power? Yeah, and that's that's something I know, like, everybody and their, their mother, brother, and cousin talks about. And... Trust me, I see it, and I know, and I hear it all the time. Oh, this kid's got no power. He's got one home run. The power is there. You can ask anybody in this organization, anybody in the Blue Jays, the power is there. It's, it's one of those things I'm trying to – and this year I've, I've struggled a little bit with it, just trying to figure out different plans, different, different strategies for pitchers to come at me. Um, trying to put the ball in play uh, as hard as I can – and as much as I can consistently. Um, to the end of the day, like what I try and tell people all the time is like I'm not, I'm not trying to be the double A, triple A Juan Soto. You know, I'm not trying to come out because at the end of the day, hitting 30 home runs in triple A doesn't matter. It really doesn't. It, it's what are you going to do for me in the big leagues? And that's something that I'm working with the hitting coach on here is just being the best hitter I can be. And then as I get older, the power, as I fill out, stuff like that will come. So I know all these guys want 20 home runs out of me, and it's just I'm not going to do that. I'm not going to go up there and try and hit 30 home runs and strike out 160 times and hit 210. Um, that's just not who I am. That's not the player I am. So it's just one of those things where I'm, I'm kind of working on it, kind of working on some stuff in my swing. Um, <coughs> Started off well here. The hitting coach here is phenomenal. Phil, he's he's the man. You know, he's already got me, got me with a different approach, different plan. Kind of have me um, hunting some pitches that I'm getting, and I, I think I've already had like three or four doubles already. So I'm just trying to keep things going. You know? Yeah, no, and actually, your exit velocity this year is you know up from where it was last year, where you were hit, where you were hitting for a little bit more power. Do you think that's a positive indicator for what's to come? That there is, you know, the power will come naturally. Absolutely, yeah. Um, the one thing I'm working on is off speed pitches. I know on fastballs, I think I'm like top three in the league for exit vetoes or top ten or something like that. Um, a lot of it's just breaking balls. Um, been trying to work on kind of staying behind those a little bit i get anxious to hit them and i get get out front a little bit but but yeah i think there's there's definitely power in there i've started to work with the, the strength coordinator here on some some hit mobility and some some lower back mobility stuff to kind of get more out of my swing um so i think i think towards the end of this year and, and the start of next year definitely there's going to be some some power changes and I wouldn't say that the – so the power is there. I've just – I've had a little bit hard time. And y'all would probably do a good job of this to you you're around the baseball world. You know what I mean when I say this. But just, like, I have the power. I haven't really learned how to unlock it yet, if that makes sense. Yeah. So I know that it's there. I, I, I know a lot of people say I have, like, a line drive swing. Um, I kind of realize that. I think – what we're doing now is kind of, like I said, learning how to use the power and learning how to unlock it and really get behind the ball and get that back going behind it. So hopefully that'll translate into some, some bombs. Yeah, for sure. Jordan, you started off as a shortstop and I think they've put you a little bit at third base. Is there any spot, you know, between those two, do you have a preference 
Because, you know, when you when you when you read around, it says that you're projected more of a third baseman than a shortstop. Do you have a preference between either or position? Not really. Um, I'm still <clears throat> I'm still learning, learning third. And I've started to play it a lot more in the upper levels. Um, I'm more I would say I'm more comfortable at short. I think I move better there. Um, the third third's fun. It's a good spot. Um, just kind of learning, like I said, learning how to play it learning the depth, stuff like that. So I think over time I could play either one. It just it, it doesn't matter. It's wherever it is availability. And Jordan, I was curious is, you know, since the trade, since you've been playing at AAA, has there been any Marlin in specific that you've gotten close to or anyone that's reached out to you from either the front office or the major league team even? Just any any connections you've made in the organization? Yeah. Um Brian Anderson and John Birdie were down here rehabbing. Um, oh, that's right. Obviously, everybody on the AAA team is, is awesome. They've been really welcoming, coaching staff, everybody. But I know John Birdie, he was really good. Um, got to talk to him a lot just because he, you know, former Blue Jay, you know, played under John Snyder, one of those guys over there. So kind of having that familiar face over here was, was good to talk to and kind of get my mind right and, and go over some things and being traded and, and, and how this organization flows and works. So it, it, was, it was really good to have him down here for a couple of days. Yeah, and that reminds me, I was wondering if you ever overlapped with another Marlins farmhand, Griffin Conine, down there in um in the Toronto system, because you know, obviously you know he's here in double A. Yeah, I didn't I didn't play with him. I think I did like a couple of days in 2019. Um, but besides that, I never got the real, real chance to play with him. Um, but I've met him, you know, talked to him all that stuff in spring training. He's a good dude. So um it'll be good seeing him again in week month. Yeah, I just wanted to ask you which pitcher in the you know throughout your minor league career would you say has been some of the most difficult to face when you're when you're up at the plate? Mason Rodriguez, without a question, is the best pitcher in minor league baseball. Yeah, and I'm not just saying that because he's from Texas and I've faced him many times. He's just I think he's the best pitcher in the minor leagues by far. Yeah, and speaking of, you know, talented, you know, minor leaguers, who on AAA has really impressed you? You know, you're saying either on the pitching side or in the lineup, who has really impressed you that, you know, you say, wow. Um, I got to go with Jonathan Aranda from Tampa Bay, from Durham. Um, he's having a year. He's doing really well, um, putting up stupid numbers. It's just a very, very well – well-rounded baseball player. You know, he does everything on the field the right way. You know, he can play defense in any position. Hitting is where he's impressive. You know, he – not only does he he hit, he hits with power, hits the ball hard consistently, and he's a very, very tough foul. Um, I think we, we played him last week, and I don't – I think I saw him strike out maybe once. Um, has a lot of walks, very, very consistent. Um, just a well on on player. Uh, and then lastly, before I hand it off to Kevin to finish it off, I guess, you know, there's a lot of rumblings about when, you know, you, you could possibly be called up. Is there any any goal of yours when you do get reached the major leagues? You know, what's your you know, ultimate goal in the big leagues, in the highest level? Just just to help the team win. You know, I think that's – at the end of the day, that's that's the goal is to, is to win and get as far as you can in the playoffs win a World Series, you know, so – if I get the chance to go up there, just just do what I can to be the best player I can be and help him win. You know, that's all that's all I can do. That's all I can control is just playing hard every day and doing what I can do. You know? Yeah, my final question is just out of all the minor league stadiums you've been at, which is your favorite just to play out and which is probably your least favorite to play out? And this actually is funny, funny enough, one of our fan questions from Sean Miller was this question. So Let's see. All right, so there's there's two different ones that are my favorite. I'd have to go with Columbus, uh, the Clippers, and the Indians AAA. Uh, that's a really good spot. Or Hartford, Connecticut. That was in AA. Uh, that was a really, really sweet part to play at. Least favorite? Let's see. Probably Portland, Maine. The Double A for the Red Sox. That place, I didn't really like that place. Um, and then probably Scranton, Triple A for the Yankees. Okay. Yeah, that's, that's probably my least favorite. Just because it's it's 
probably one of the toughest parts in the minor leagues to hit at, I would say. Got it. So, All right. So. I think that's where we will end it. Jordan, for sure. Thank you. Thank you for joining us here. Um, just if you have any words for the fans, any message you want to give them and where they could find you on uh, social media. Yeah, uh, I think you just type in my name for social media. I'm not, I'm not going to lie. I'm not very, very active on it. Um, I try and stay away from all that stuff just because, you know, everybody's got their own opinion. But um, to the fans, I would just say love me or hate me, I'm here. Um, and I'm going to do the best I can to be the best player and, and best person I can be for this franchise and, and hopefully help us win. You know? For sure. Once again, thank you, Jordan. Once again, like and subscribe to the to YouTube, to the podcast, wherever you listen to it. And we'll see you guys all in the next one. Peace out and go fish.